Hey, well, good uh, morning and uh, good afternoon whenever you're looking at this. I'm Bill Thomas, pastor at Hereford Faith and Life Church out in uh, Hereford or Moncton area, uh, Baltimore County. And uh, glad you're with us. Uh, this is Memorial Day weekend, and uh, we certainly want to uh, remember our troops and their families. Uh, what a sacrifice that has been paid from generation to generation and even now. Let's pray for them. Heavenly Father, thank you for our freedom. Thank you for those men and women, the families that are sacrificing, that we might enjoy this freedom, that are defending uh, goodness and liberty around the world. Uh, we just bless them. Lord, we bless all those families who've lost loved ones over the many, many generations uh, who have served their country so well. And Lord, we just pray again, you would open our eyes and ears today as we hear your word and respond to it in faith. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, uh, Memorial Day is, of course, the United States federal holiday. Uh, it was observed, it's always observed the last Monday uh, in May. Of course, it's May 27th uh, here in 2024. It was first called Decoration Day. It was uh, commemorating uh, U.S. men uh, and women who died uh, while in military service. It was first enacted uh, in, to honor Union soldiers who fell during the American Civil War and then expanded to honor all United States soldiers who've given their lives for the service of our country. And we also want to remember and honor those men and women currently serving right now, veterans and military families. Well, it's really appropriate uh, with Memorial Day uh, weekend to talk about a very strong image and truth that you discover uh, in the church and, and in the scripture. Uh, that is this, as committed disciples of Jesus Christ, we are soldiers in God's vast army throughout the ages and in the midst of a great, great war. And not a war for territories or nations, but a war for the very hearts and souls of all men and women for all eternity. Paul unashamedly writes Timothy, the young pastor, who he mentored in the faith, and he said this, read it with me. Endure suffering with me as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And as Christ's soldier, do not let yourself become tied up in the affairs of this life, for then you cannot satisfy the one who has listed you in his army. Brothers and sisters, we are soldiers of God. We're part of the Lord's army. Our captain is Jesus Christ. One of the highest compliments that Paul bestows upon faithful disciples fighting the good fight of faith and living for Christ in a hostile pagan world was that he called them soldiers, good soldiers. He does it a couple more times in other letters. In his letter, uh, uh, Philippians uh, chapter 2, verse 25, he writes, Meanwhile, I thought I should send Aphrodite back to you. He's a true brother, a faithful worker, a courageous soldier, and he was your messenger to help me in my need. That uh, doesn't mean he wasn't serving in the Roman uh, army. He's a soldier of the Lord. In Philemon chapter 1, verses 1 through 2, this letter is from Paul in prison for preaching the good news about Christ Jesus and from our brother Timothy. It is written to Philemon, our much-loved co-worker, and to our sister Aphia and Archippus, a fellow soldier of the cross. I am also writing to the church that meets in your house. So listen, people of God, we are in a war of all wars. Uh, it is an epic war for the souls of a lost humanity. And it's a war that began in the Garden of Eden at the fall of man and has been fought and waged throughout every generation, throughout the history of the human race. And it continues today, even as we worship this weekend. And our enemy is brutal. Uh, he's relentless. He takes no prisoners. He offers no mercy, no terms of surrender. It's either death or submission to his diabolical hatred for all things good and a love for all things evil. No doubt you've uh, walked by some of his soldiers probably today, um, maybe uh, on your way to shopping, maybe uh, stopping uh, at an appointment. Uh, they're everywhere. And Jesus 
was referring to this enemy. Here's what he said about the enemy. He said, the thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. Kill, steal, and destroy. The thief here, Jesus is talking about Satan. That's our enemy's mission. It's bold and clear to wreak mayhem upon the human race, to kill as many, to destroy as many, to steal away their souls. And he targets the human race because only humans were created in the image of God and bear his likeness. Satan uh, abhors God. And because humans bear the divine image of God, the fingerprint of God, if you want to put it that way, that's why he abhors us as well. And when he defaces us, destroys us, uh, mars our soul, it's like defacing God himself in his eyes. And so for that reason alone, he does all he can day and night to distort and mar the image of God that we bear, to kill, steal, and destroy you and me, our children, our children's children, our marriages, our families. His intent has always been clear from the very beginning, to pervert all that is holy and good, and to bring to ruin every man and woman and child on the planet, especially targeting those who battle against this evil foe who call upon the name of Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. His demon armies never take leave. They never tire. They have no sense of moral values or military codes of honor. They think nothing of destroying and tearing apart innocent lives. They know no boundaries to their evil. There are no limits to their destruction and tortures and attacks upon the human race. Even the unbelieving world caught a glimpse of hell's armies in the ruthless demonic attack launched against defenseless teenagers and men and women, families, even little children on October 7th, as Hamas left the Gaza Strip in a brutal, ruthless, and deadly surprise attack against innocent concert goers celebrating Israel's Memorial Day to honor their soldiers. It was the deadliest attack on Jews since the Holocaust, slaughtering babies, raping women, beheading babies, burning whole families alive, taking hundreds of innocent civilians hostage and filming all of it to be proudly displayed and celebrated in social media as part of the genocide of the Jewish people. Unfortunately, most of the world does not see through the lens of God's word. They fail to see this nefarious hatred as spiritual evil. They see through the lens of politics, of histories, of national struggles. But listen, we Christians, we soldiers of Jesus Christ had better see the real battlefield laid out in front of us, in our nation, in our communities, our schools, even our churches, even on our very doorsteps. Paul is very adamant about this war. Listen to his words to us who believe, as Paul wrote them, inspired by the Holy Spirit. Ephesians chapter 6. And a final word, be strong with the Lord's mighty power. Put on God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all strategies and tricks of the devil. For we're not fighting against people made of flesh and blood, but against the evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world against those mighty powers of darkness who rule this world and against wicked spirits in the heavenly realms. Use every piece of God's armor to resist the enemy in time of evil, so that after the battle, you will still be standing firm. Stand your ground. Put, putting on the sturdy belt of truth and the body armor of God's righteousness. For shoes put on the sandals that will be uh, that comes from the good news so that you'll be fully prepared in every battle you'll need faith as your shield to stop the fiery arrows aimed at you by satan put on salvation as your helmet take on the sword of the spirit which is the word of god pray at all times on every occasion in the power of the holy spirit stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all christians everywhere put on the full armor of god that's a command. Why? Because we're soldiers in the Lord's army and we're in a war. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 10, uh, verses 3 through 5, Although we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does, since the weapons of our warfare are not of flesh. They are powerful through God for the demolition, uh, 
demolition, <laughs> demolition, excuse me, of strongholds. We demolish arguments and every high-minded thing that is raised up against the knowledge of God, taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. People listen, bowing to the politically correct. Many denominations and churches have dropped hymns, hymnity, songs, or altered the original lyrics written by our forefathers and foremothers in the faith who understood that the Bible teaches that we're in a spiritual war. And the speech police, they don't care for lyrics that accentuate and, and emphasize war and violence. And as we curtsy and bow as a church, and we don't push back on our culture because the contemporary church prefers to be a nice church, a church that doesn't offend, a church with good manners, a church that wants everybody to feel good instead of a victorious church. It was common for Christians of past generations not that long ago to boldly sing, Onward Christian Soldiers, marching us to war with the cross of Jesus going on before. Christ, the royal master, leads against the foe forward into battle. See his banners go. It infuriates me to see our present administration abandon Israel, failing to admit that we're at a war with radical Islamic terrorists bent on destroying not to only Jews, but Christians. Who knows how many terror cells have poured through our open borders and are now waiting to unleash their pain and destruction. It infuriates me to witness the rise of evil and hatred towards Jewish people, and not just in Israel, but right here in the United States, the land of the free. How can anybody not see that we are in a life and death struggle of epic proportions? Yet at the same time, most Christians today, followers of Jesus Christ, while the battles are raging all around us, won't admit it. Warfare and battles and fights, they're, they're so inconvenient. They're uncomfortable. We're more concerned with the cost of gas or food or mortgages. Seeing our liberties and freedoms may be stripped away. We turn a blind eye to the weaponization of our government towards pro-life Catholics. The vicious attack of the right to, uh, of the unborn. Our culture is making us celebrate evil, calling it good. And what is good call evil. And through it all, again, we're told as the church, be nice, be kind, be quiet, stay in your own lane, stay out of the fray. Don't, don't go into the public square and whatever you do, don't offend anybody. Don't make anybody feel uncomfortable in their lifestyle and choices. Hide in your castles, out of sight, out of mind. In the scriptures, a wealthy young man came to Jesus, wanted to know how to be right with God and Jesus gave him some of the Ten Commandments, and the man passed the test. He said, Master, I've obeyed these commandments since I was young. What else must I do? Listen to the response, Mark chapter 10, verse 20. Looking at the man, Jesus felt genuine love for him. There's still one thing you haven't done, he told him. Go and sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor. You'll have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. At this, the man's face fell, and he went away sad, for he had many possessions. Now, let me just, I, I bring that because of this. If, if Jesus wanted to be nice, he, he would have called the man back, saying, whoa, 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 come back. Um, uh, look, I didn't really mean sell all your possessions upon me. I mean, you couldn't do that. I, I, that's, a, that's too much. How about 50%? No, the man still turns and walks away. Well, no, no, come back, come back. Uh, how about 10%? The man's just shaking his head, walking away. No, look, look, you, you're a good guy. You keep those commandments. You're interested. It, it's really important. I fill as many seats in my sanctuary as I can. So, so just follow me the way you are. Jesus didn't do that. Nice churches do that, but anything, uh, you know, to fill pews, to fill seats, but not Jesus. Jesus said, if you want to follow me, you must die to yourself, pick up your cross, and follow me. And man, you might think, Bill, that is a hard message. <laughs> I guarantee it's not nice by any stretch. Here's the reality. If you are a follower of Jesus, you are sold out to him, committed to him. You are a soldier in the army of the Lord. 
And I know most Christians don't want to talk about their faith and discipleship in terms of military and soldiers and warfare, because if they did, they'd have to reconcile the vast difference of their contradictory lifestyle that appears not to be wartime of sacrifice, of service, of duty, but a lifestyle that appears that we're in a time of peaceful prosperity with our culture and our world. I can tell you this. Our enemy knows he's in a war and is diabolically throwing every foul and destructive weapon he has at you and me, the church of Jesus Christ, day in and day out. So what does it take to be a good soldier for Christ? Since we are enlisted, we said yes to Christ. We're yes in his army. Well, first, a good soldier has made the choice to fight the good fight. To go into battle with Christ and for Christ. To give him all you've got till you can't fight anymore. The Apostle Paul, at the end of his life, summed it up with these words. Let's read it together from 2 Timothy. I have fought the good fight. I finished the race. I've kept the faith. Now there's in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to the all who have longed for his appearing. By choosing Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, giving him our lives, we've enlisted in God's army, and with the armory, armor and weapon of God's ready for spiritual combat and warfare. And drawn by the Holy Spirit, we yielded our lives to Jesus alone, the captain of the Lord's host, commander of the fight. And we're not ashamed of him or his gospel, never wavering in his cause. We will do our duty. We will fulfill our mission to the best of our God-given ability. And in his power, we make the choice to fight the good fight. Secondly, a good soldier... must have courage. A good soldier is courageous. When Moses handed over the command of the Israelites to Joshua in Joshua chapter 1, Moses knew he was going to be taken back to heaven. He was going to die. And uh, he had to pass that leadership on. God says several times in this first chapter, again and again, Joshua, be strong and have courage. Let me read just some of it. Joshua chapter 1, verse 6. Be strong and courageous because you'll lead these people to inherit the land I swore their ancestors to give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey my law. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. God repeated again and again. So that his word would penetrate Joshua's heart and give him the courage for the many battles ahead that Joshua would lead God's people to possess the promised land. And like Joshua, listen, we need the word of God to penetrate our hearts that we might be courageous in the face of our ancient and crafty enemy and in a world that seeks to bring us to our knees in compromise. Third, a good soldier must endure hard times. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast. That word endures under trial. For when he stood the test, he'll receive the crown of life, which God has promised those who love him. Being a soldier is a hard life. Soldier has much to bear. Boot camp, training, sparse rations, discomfort, not to mention danger. Soldier must endure suffering without murmuring or questioning the mission. It's a soldier's power of endurance that is often the very means of victory. Though it often seems like we are losing the battle, Jesus, our captain, says to us, stay on mission, bring lost souls to the foot of my cross. And a good soldier knows that victory is worth the struggle and the risks of all the hardships endured. The fourth quality, a good soldier has a confident hope in victory. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 57, but thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, in all human battles and wars, there's great uncertainty. Not so in our spiritual warfare. Jesus, our captain, has already triumphed, and we follow him to the fruits of his victory. 
that he won on the cross. Look at what it says in Romans 8, 37. In all these things, we win an overwhelming victory through him who has proved his love for us. We are certain of his power, certain of his success, and our hope is in him. He's the anchor of our souls. The battle we're fighting now may be very dark and discouraging. Circumstances and probabilities may seem all lined up against us, but don't lose heart. The battle belongs to the Lord, and God gives us victory. You know, our greatest uh, uh, need uh, is just that confident hope. Here's how one uh, writer put it. I've enlisted myself for life. And with courage, endurance, and hope, I will press forward. I may not have to fight long, but I will fight faithfully. Let me rest upon his power. Let me give myself up to his care. Let me prize him even as chief among 10,000. In his favor is life. In his loving kindness is better than life. He will be my strength and my salvation. Martin Treptow left his job in a small town barbershop here in the States in 1917 to go to France to fight in the Great War against the Germans in the famed Rainbow Division of the U.S. Army. There on the Western Front, he was killed trying to carry a message between battalions under heavy, heavy artillery fire. During the lull in the fighting, soldiers recovered his body, and in his personal belongings, they found his diary. And on the opening page, the flyleaf under the heading, My Pledge, he had written these words, America must win this war. Therefore, I will work, I will save, I will sacrifice, I will endure, I will fight cheerfully and do my utmost as if the issue of the whole struggle depended upon me alone. People, that's the spirit that we honor on this Memorial Day of the many men and women and families who paid the ultimate cost on the altars of freedom. And church, listen today, we need that spirit too. We're not going to win this war trying to be a nice church or an acceptable church or a quiet church while the war rages around us. You know, a study done 15 years ago reported that all high schoolers who attend church, 70% of them, when they graduate, will never come back. And I'm sure that percentage has risen. Another study reported that over 200 million Americans have no church home. That makes the United States the fourth largest unchurched nation in the world. Think about it. Someone once penned, We're soldiers fighting for our God. Let trembling cowards fly. We'll stand on shake and firm and fix with Christ to live and die. Let devils rage and hell assail. We'll fight our passage through. Let foes unite and friends desert. We'll seize the crown in view. Let's stay in the fight, church. Brothers and sisters, for the sake of Jesus Christ, who gave his life for us, who fought the good fight. Listen, Jesus wants us to fight for him. Fight for the souls of people around us. You know, our greatest threat to America is not economic crisis. It's not health care. It's not even terrorism. The greatest threat is that we Christians, followers of Jesus Christ, kingdom lovers, are living as if there is no war at all, when in reality, we're in the midst of a spiritual war that's destroying people, families, youth all around us. And they're falling, falling mortally wounded at our feet. And we go on each day living as if all is well. On February 19th, 1945, the battle for Iwo Jima began. Iwo Jima was a barren eight-mile square island, 600 miles south of Tokyo, Japan. It was guarded by 22,000 Japanese soldiers committed to fight to the death. They guarded two airstrips that America needed to strategically contain the Japanese aggression after Pearl Harbor and preserve the liberty that America cherished. It was a high and noble cost. The sacrifice was stunning. Jack Lucas lied his way into the Marines at age 14. He was assigned as a truck driver in Hawaii, but he wanted to fight, so he stowed away on a transport boat, surviving on food that sympathetic soldiers would steal from the dining hall. With no rifle in his hand, he landed with the first wave of soldiers on the beach at Iwo Jima, and as soldiers fell around him, he quickly grabbed the rifle lying on the beach next to a dead soldier and fought his way inland. 
with three companions in a foxhole. He fought hand-to-hand -hand combat against a group of eight Japanese soldiers. In the fight, an enemy grenade landed at his feet. He quickly stomped on it to get it deep into the sand, yelling at his friends to run when another grenade rolled in. Jack Lucas, 17 years old, immediately fell on the two grenades and absorbed the explosions with his body saving his comrades. Miraculously, he opened his eyes and found himself on the hospital ship Samaritan with doctors amazed and astounded he was still alive. He endured 21 reconstructive surgeries, became the nation's youngest Medal of Honor winner. Americans have sacrificed so much for liberty, for freedom. But many Marines paid even a heavier price than Jack Lucas. When the battle for Iwo Jima was over, the American soldiers had killed about 21,000 Japanese, but at the horrific cost of 26,000 American lives. The U.S. Marines fought in World War II for 43 months, yet in that one month on Iwo Jima, one-third of their total deaths occurred. They left behind the largest cemetery in the Pacific, and outside that cemetery is a chiseled, chiseled sign that reads, When you go home, tell them for us and say, For your tomorrow we gave our today. Wow, when I hear and see that kind of courage and sacrifice, I want to cry out to God, don't let me waste my life on lesser things, Lord. Use me in your battle. Let me fight on in your front lines. I don't want comfort. I don't want convenience. I want don't want to be at home here on planet Earth. Let me risk my life and give my life for your cause to win this world for Christ. And when my end comes, let me be able to say to my family, to my city, to my community, to the unreached peoples of the world, and to you, my church family, for your tomorrow I gave my today. And not just your tomorrow on earth, but for the countless tomorrows of eternity. How do you choose to live your Christian life? Are you going to live out being a disciple with urgency and sacrifice, giving your time and energy and resource to gain the victory and take the gospel to a dying world? This Memorial Day is a battle cry from God. Will we join or we will we abandon? Abandon it all for the sake of his call. I'm amazed how even people who don't know Christ will often rise to remarkable levels of sacrifice, even laying down their lives for causes that cannot compare with Christ. Yes, our fighting for freedom and liberty is right and noble, but no war on earth was ever fought for a greater cause or king than the one we face today as Christians. Onward Christian soldiers marching as to war, with the cross of Jesus going on before. Christ, the royal master, leads against the foe forward into battle. See his banners go. Onward, Christian soldiers, marching as to war, with the cross of Jesus going on before. At the name of Jesus, Satan's host doth flee. O oh, then, Christian soldiers, on to victory. Hell's foundations quiver at the shout of praise. Brothers, lift your voices, loud your anthems raise. Like a mighty army moves the church of God. Brothers, we are treading, we're saints of trod. We're not divided, all one body we one in faith and spirit, one eternally. Crowns and thorns may perish, kingdoms rise and wane, but the church of Jesus constant will remain. Gates of hell can never against the church prevail. We have Christ's own promise, which can never fail. Onward then, ye people, join our happy throng. Blend with ours your voices in triumph song. Glory, loud and honor unto Christ the King. Through countless ages, men and angels sing. Onward, Christian soldiers. Thank you, Arthur Selvin, for writing those lyrics. May they reflect our hearts as well. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the cross. We thank you for our Savior, the captain of the Lord's army, Jesus. Lord, help us. Encourage us to step up, to step it up to be a victorious church, to battle in the Lord's strength, in the armor of God for the sake of humanity, the sake of dying souls lost, going to hell, 
Help us battle, Lord. Give us the courage. Give us the endurance. Lord, give us the power through your Holy Spirit. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Well, we thank you, and uh, I'm blessed that you spent this time with me. Hope you're encouraged. Go out and be the church in your world, in your community, right? Starting with your family, neighborhood, live for Jesus Christ. Lift high that banner, onward, Christian soldier. The Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you. May he be gracious unto you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, go be the hands and feet of Christ in your world. Amen. God bless you. Have a great, great Memorial Day weekend.